From Kewaskum to Germantown, Hartford to Newburgh, and everywhere in between, this is the History is Fun podcast. History is Fun is brought to you by the Washington County Historical Society, whose mission is to educate, preserve, interpret, and provide access to the history of Washington County, Wisconsin through our collections, archives, and programs. Visit us on the web at historyisfun.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Justin Agar Pratt, and I'm the Education and Public Programs Coordinator at the History Center. The purpose of this series is to continue to carry out our mission uh, during these extraordinary and trying times. Each week, I will bring the history of Washington County to you, and it's my hope that this series will engage and educate you. New episodes will be uploaded to our YouTube channel and shared to our Facebook page on Mondays and Fridays. If you're new to the channel, hit that subscribe button and click the bell icon to be notified when we upload new videos every Monday and Friday. We're also on Facebook. You can find us at History Center Washington County. Okay, let's move on to the main segment. In this episode, we're going to learn about Wisconsin's native people, the Woodland Indians. Similar to the last episode, you'll get to see images of the objects that you would normally get to handle during this presentation. I'll also ask questions that I'd normally pose to students and other attendees. If you're watching with kids, the question portion of the slide would be a great time to pause the video and have a quick discussion with them, then resume when you're ready. So first, let's define the term woodland. Um, now in this case, woodland refers to both a period of time and a place where people lived. The woodland time period spans from about 1,000 to 3,000 years ago. And the woodland tribes lived in the Great Lakes region of what is now the United States and Canada. And there were many people and tribes in the woodland group, but because of where they lived, they spoke similar languages ate similar foods, lived in similar houses, and shared other elements of culture. Now you can see I've got this map of what is today um, North America, and the Woodland Indians would have lived in the area that is circled in red. We have the six major tribes of Wisconsin. We have the Chippewa in the dark green area. This includes the Ojibwe Band, the Bad River Band, and the Red Cliff Band. The Ho-Chunk down in the brown area, also known as the Winnebago. Ho-Chunk means big voice, and it's what tribal members called themselves, and outsiders called them Winnebago. The Menominee in that gold section, they're the oldest known continuous inhabitants of Wisconsin and still occupy a large portion of their homeland. We have that little area within the gold part of the state, the Mohegans, and that includes the Stockbridge Muncie Band. Then we have another small section with the Oneida. They're part of the six nations of the Iroquois. And then we have that turquoise portion down at the bottom of the state, which included the Potawatomi, also known as the Nishinbek. Now the woodland tribes differed from the people that came before them in Wisconsin because they were the first groups of people to grow corn and they were the first to make pottery. Now focusing in even closer on the tribes of Washington County, both Menominee and Potawatomi had villages near Silver and Pike Lakes, and also near the village of Kewaskum. Cultures are very complex, and, and some people will spend their lives studying just one part of a culture. And because cultures are so complex, we're going to focus specifically on the tools of the woodland Indians. So, what is this? What do you think you can do with it? Well, this is birch bark, and uh, this represents the wooden tools that would have been used, and, and they would have been made of maple, birch, or elm wood, and then uh, carved by bone or stone tools. And on this slide, we have a number of different items that would have been made from wood. Uh, we have a toboggan. Uh, traditional toboggans are made of bound parallel wood slats, all bent forward at the front to form a sideways J shape, uh, which keeps the sled from digging into the snow. So what might you use a toboggan for? 
Well, a few things that you could use it for would be to pull game back to camp after hunting, uh, transporting other supplies or people in the winter. Speaking of winter, we also have snowshoes. These are made of a wooden frame and leather lacing. So how do snowshoes help you walk in the winter? Well, they help you keep balance, but they also spread your weight over a greater surface so you don't fall through the snow. Some other wooden tools that we have on this slide are a bead loom, cradle boards, and a sap yoke. You might be wondering to yourself, why do I only have pictures and reproductions of wooden tools to share with you? Well, what happens to wood when it's left outside in the rain, snow, sun, and wind? Well, wooden tools like antler and bone tools often deteriorate pretty quickly. And though there are examples of all of these tools, stone and metal tools survive use and natural elements far better than organic tools. Uh, woodland tools do still exist. Uh, the Milwaukee Public Museum has several artifacts on exhibit. These are wigwams and they were made from bark and bent tree limbs and they served as dwellings for the woodland Indians. What is this? What do you think you can do with it? This is a bowl. It's a reproduction of a birch bark bowl and you can see how the holes were drilled into the bark and how sinew was threaded through to lace the edges together. What is this? What do you think you can do with it? This is sinew. Uh, sinew is a tendon or ligament and it holds a muscle to bone or bone to other bone. And these tendons are long and strong so they were collected during butchering and preserved to be used for ties and laces. And I mentioned it on that previous slide with uh, the birch bark bowl reproduction. Now, this is an image of artificial sinew, and it's made of nylon, uh, but it's very similar to the real thing. What is this? What do you think I can do with it? This is a miniature reproduction of a canoe, and this shows how canoes were shaped and held together. What do you think this is? And once you figure that out, what can I do with it? Well, this represents animal bone tools, and like the wooden tools, there are only examples of the materials to show you. Antler and bone deteriorate uh, pretty quickly, and, and they're harder to find. Deer antler and ribs could be used for points, knives, spearheads, awls, needles, scrapers, and fish hooks. You could also make musical rasps, flutes, and toys. Other uses include carving them into hair combs, hairpins, and jewelry. What is this? Well, this is a piece of pottery, and uh, clay pots were often decorated by wrapping the soft clay with a rope or string, and you can kind of see those lines toward the top of the piece of clay. After pressing the rope into the soft clay, the rope was removed and the clay was then fired to dry and then uh, harden. Now, this specific piece is authentic and uh, it's about a thousand years old. What is this? Well, we talked a little bit about this one in our geology and glaciers presentation. This is float copper, and it's a metal found along lakes and rivers. And if you remember, glaciers gouged copper out of the mountains in Canada and left it behind when the glaciers melted. The woodland Indians would collect the copper, heat it, and then mold it into tools. Uh, some uses for copper tools would include fish hooks, spearheads, and scrapers. What is this? What do you think I can do with it? Well, we're moving on from metal tools to stone tools, and this is an arrowhead, and it was used on the end of an arrow. Arrowheads varied in size, shape, and thickness, but were all made of chipped stone, and they can still be found throughout Washington County. Uh, what is this? What do you think I can do with it? 
This is a hand axe used for cutting down trees, chipping firewood, carving, etc. The flat rounded edges fit comfortably into your hand. The groove around the stone may have been created later to attach the head to a handle of wood or bone. What might that tell us? Well, it tells us that the groove is rougher than the rest of the axe, suggesting that it might be more recent and it hasn't had as much time uh, to smooth out. What is this? What can I do with it? This is a hammer stone, and that's a rounded, heavy stone used for pounding meat and grinding grain. Now, where do you think you would find a stone like this? That's right, you would probably find it near a river or a stream. Now, do you think this hammer stone was altered by a human? How do you think you could make this stone smooth if, if you didn't find it by the river? What is this? By looking at it, what do you think you can do with it? Well, this is a drill, which is a long and slender stone often made from old or broken arrowheads. And a drill made holes in bone, shells, leather, and wood. Now, why would you need holes in these materials? Well, if you remember earlier, we talked about sinew, which was used kind of like thread. So you would have to make those holes in order to thread the sinew through it. Now, sometimes a drill would be attached to a handle and it would be used to make holes in the soil for planting seeds. What do you think this is? What can I do with it? Well, this is a scraper, and a scraper is a stone with one thin, sharp side used to scrape meat and fat from animal hides. Now, why would you want to scrape off all the meat and fat from the skin before you make it into clothes? That's right. It, if you left the meat on the skin, uh, it, it would rot along with the fat, and you wouldn't smell very good. Now, let's head over to the curator's corner. One of our curator Janine's favorite new uploads to our digital collection are artifacts recently donated from the Crafts Farm in Farmington. It contains arrowheads, like the one pictured on this slide, pottery and beads dating from around 8,000 years ago up to around 500 years ago. Based on the materials, dates, and location near the Milwaukee River, it's likely that American Indians used the farm as a campsite over many generations and cultural changes. To find this collection, search CRASS under the keyword search at the link below. And now for our final segment, from the Research Center. Sticking with my recent sports theme, I thought I'd pay tribute to what would normally be opening week for baseball. Pictured as the City of Hartford baseball team from around 1908, and though we don't know for sure who everyone is, the lineup that year was Rudy, who is in the second row, first from the left, Jack Hollowell, who is in the first row, third from the left, Christman, A. Getz, J. Getz, Casper, Dinkle, Radke, who's in the second row, fifth from the left, Marsh, Hobson, and Hertberg. The suited man is likely manager William Schmidt, and the boy in the middle is the Bat Boy. If you are looking for a way to support the History Center, head to historyisfun.com and click on the support tab. There you'll find all sorts of ways to support us, including donation and membership information. If you're already a member, thank you so much. Your membership makes what we do, including this podcast, possible. Remember, we'll post new episodes on Mondays and Fridays to our YouTube channel as well as our Facebook page. Be sure to catch the next episode as we move forward on our timeline of Washington County and Wisconsin history to learn about the French fur trade, right here on History is Fun.